we are looking at scriptures which talk about the end times. We know that's coming, amen? It should not surprise us. And while that can evoke some scary feelings or thoughts, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It should be something that we look forward to. We read the end of the Bible last week where it said that very thing, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, the sooner the better. Today we're going to be focusing on what Jesus says about all this. There's a lot of scripture, both Old and New Testament, where people are talking about the old times, where God the Father is talking about the end times. But now let's hear from Jesus. We are going to be quoting Jesus a lot today. We're going to be hearing what Jesus has to say about the end times. Especially towards the end of his life as he was getting closer to his death, the cross. He spoke more openly about the end times. In three of the four Gospels, he speaks quite a lot. Verse after verse, chapter after chapter about the end days, the end times. What will happen when the end time, before the end times come and when the end times come? He spoke quite a lot telling us believers, followers, disciples what to do. And so we're going to be hearing that today. Now, in the first scripture we're going to be hearing, uh, this is uh, not Jesus speaking. This is uh, uh, Paul speaking. You know, times are rough, amen? 2020 has not been the best of years. It's been rough. We've heard a lot of, we've witnessed and seen, at least through the news, a lot of difficulties, a lot of uh, challenges, a lot of problems. And these will continue. Wild guess. Unfortunately, 2020 has not been a good year for most folks. But guess what? Most years are that way. Most all years, there's been wars, famines, problems, strife, division, conflict. Amen. There's hardly been any time in history where everything was hunky-dory. In the early New Testament church, times were rough then too. The believers were being persecuted for their faith, martyred for their faith. And as they were being martyred, especially when the disciples started to die, the 12 disciples or the 11 disciples, when they started to die, it caused a kind of an internal earthquake among believers. It caused a a spiritual problem, a crisis of belief among some of the believers thinking, now wait a minute, such and such disciple, he's gone now. Did we miss it? Did we miss the boat? Has Jesus come already? That was a big issue back then. Some of the believers in the churches were thinking, worrying that they had already missed Jesus' return. They thought it was just around the corner. Good way to believe, by the way. But they were thinking, did we miss the boat? And so Paul wrote back to the church of Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, to address this and to tell them, no, you haven't missed the boat yet. Jesus has not yet returned. He talks about what will happen, future tense. That's the first half of this scripture. And then the second half of this scripture, he's telling them and telling us how to live waiting for Jesus Christ to return. So, we're going to take the first half, first, first Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel in your midst. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, meaning die, or to grieve like the rest of man who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so that we believe that God will bring up with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise 
first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. We'll stop right there for a moment. Please be seated. Let's talk about Jesus. You like that? <clears throat> Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about how he spoke about the end times a lot, especially as he got closer to the cross. He gave a lot of parables, a lot of lessons about the end times, about the future. With each of these parables, with each of these lessons, there was a message, very big, very important message, very clear message for us believers. We're going to be looking at that. <clears throat> if we were, <clears throat> excuse me, if we were to look at all of these parables and lessons, it would probably take it would take several months to go through. We're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to take a shortcut. <laughs> we're going to go to the bottom line message of each of these parables, of these messages that Jesus spoke in story format. The bottom line, the takeaway message, so that. We can bundle all these together and see what we're looking at, what God wants us to live, how to live, and what God wants us to do, knowing that His time is near. So, <clears throat> we're going to be hearing from Jesus. He wants us to know this. I'm not going to add much to it. Say amen. Okay, I know you would like that. We're going to be hearing mostly Jesus speak. Now, if you disagree with what you hear, then you're arguing with Jesus, not me. So, keep that in mind. I don't expect you to remember all these th things that we're, you're going to be hearing. There's so much that Jesus is saying, these bottom line messages. But I invite you to go to your Bible and read these things. They're not scary because we know what happens in the end. Amen? We'll be, we just heard it. We'll be taken up in the air to be with Jesus. So, listen to these messages from Jesus. And I kind of put this in categor seven categories, seven prophetic words or statements from Jesus about the end times, what we can expect and why we shouldn't be surprised. So, last week I counted to five. Got there okay. I, I'm going a little bit further than that. I might need help. If I get mixed up, let me know. As on my way to seven, Okay. The first one, Jesus talks about that false prophets and false Christs will arise. Again, Jesus says, Mark 13, 6, Many will come in my name proclaiming, I am He, and will deceive many. Has that happened yet? Yes. If you read your history, that will happen again or more as we go into the future. Jesus also said in Mark 13, 21 to 22, He says, At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here's the Christ, or look, there He is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect. That's us. To deceive us, if that were possible. What Jesus is saying, folks, is when Jesus really does come, you won't need anybody to tap you on the shoulder and say, look, there he is. No, everybody will get it. Everybody will know. It'll be clear. It'll be obvious. The whole world will know it. Nobody will have to tell you. Number two, no, we're not there yet. He warns us to then in all of this to be aware. Don't be taken in by the lies and deceptions. Don't be taken in by that. And even though it's clear that nobody knows when Jesus is coming back, he says that clearly in Mark 13, to be on guard, to watch out for all this stuff. And in other words, not only that, but in Mark 13, he says that essentially seven different times. Listen to these. Seven times he says that in short span. Watch out that no one deceives you. 
You must be on your guard. Verse 9. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. Verse 23. Number 4. Be on your guard. He repeats himself. Do you think he's trying to tell us something? Verse 33. Verse 35. Therefore keep watch. He's trying to make it very clear, very plain to us. Wake up. Be aware. Be on your guard. Be on the lookout. For Jesus, be on the lookout for not to be deceived by people who are pretending to be Him. And then the last one, number six. If He comes suddenly, do not f- let Him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Jesus, in verse 36. So you can sleep during worship, that's okay. But don't spiritually go to sleep in your daily life because Jesus is coming and he tells us to be wide awake spiritually, to be aware, to watch, to be on guard, etc., etc. Okay, that's the first thing that Jesus says. Second thing Jesus has to tell us is that something that's very unfortunate but it's not new. There will be wars, rumors of wars. There will be famines, earthquakes, and natural disasters. Has that been happening? Yes, and that's been happening all along, unfortunately. Yes, ma'am. You're just stretching. Okay, very good. Jesus reminds us that we know these are prophetic words to pass every time we hear about that in the paper or on the news. Jesus predicted these sad, terrible things that are happening as part of his return. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains, Mark 13, 7 through 8, also found in Matthew 24. So he's telling us the world is an upheaval for a reason. Because Jesus is coming. All this stuff can produce what? Worry, fear, dread in us. Amen? But it shouldn't. Yes, these are sad things, terrible things. Don't wish them on anybody. But when we see these sad, sad, terrible things, let it remind you that Jesus is coming and we should rejoice in that. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen? No, I don't wish these terrible things on anyone. But what you hear in the news should be a reminder that because things are getting worse, Jesus is coming soon. Number three, he tells us clearly that believers will be prosecuted, persecuted, will be chased down, they will be hated, they will even be put to death. And at the same time, the gospel will spread and be preached to all nations. Let me quote Jesus. Mark 13, 9 through 13. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. Mark 13, 9 through 13. It's also found in Matthew 24. Pretty rough stuff, isn't it? This is not fun and games. But this is a sign pointing to his return. It's not occurring by happenstance. There's a reason for all these terrible things that are happening. Because Jesus Christ is returning. Number four, moving on. There will be an increase in wickedness in the world. Can anybody disagree with that? Didn't think so. And many will grow, listen carefully, many believers will grow distant or cold or lukewarm to God. Here we are in Matthew 24, verse 12 through 13. Beware of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. That involves us, folks. That should be a warning for us to 
remain faithful, to remain on fire for Jesus. Not to grow cold, not even to grow lukewarm. You know lukewarm is the worst place to be in your faith. Jesus warns us against that. Satan's after your heart, folks. And he's getting some people. So stay on fire for Jesus in your walk with him. This will be hard for those who remain faithful to watch, but we can trust that God will help you when you are tested, when you are tempted, when you are uh, dragged away, tempted so much to be dragged away from Jesus. God will help you. You're not doing this on your own. God will give you all the strength and all the perseverance you need to endure, to remain faithful to the end. Jesus is simply warning us, some will fall away. Don't be one of them in your faith walk with Jesus. Now, I don't judge folks by not coming to church and stuff like that. I don't do that, but still it's a big sign. I remember folks telling me, and I'm saying this respectfully, I remember many of the old timers of this church who used to tell me, oh, well, you should have been here such and such a year or whatever. The, the church would be full every week, and I believe them. I do. I've seen pictures where the church was full, not just on Christmas, but I, I've been told so many times by some of the very elderly folks, folks who passed on now, they said, oh, church used to be full all the time. Sunday school used to be full, and look at us now. Is there a falling away? Again, I don't judge people whether they come to church or not, but there's certainly room for more people here, amen? There's certainly room for all people to come to all churches to get right with God. Jesus said there will be a falling away, and we're witnessing it, unfortunately. Number five, the times will be very difficult and distressing for all. Is that a, a, a surprise to you? <laughs> times are rough. Let's let Jesus do the talking. In Mark 13, verse 16 through 18, he said, How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning. So he's not just talking about women. He's talking about all of us and how bad it will be when, as we get closer to the day. Things will really, really be rough. But hang in there. It's distressing to think about this, to, to re-hear about this as believers, to know that, listen, folks, listen carefully. Things will get worse. As bad as it is now, Jesus says it's going to get worse. Yeah, they might cure the virus and things like that. Things might get better here and there, but overall, overall, things are going to get worse, Jesus says. For Christians, that's simply a sign that he's getting closer and closer to returning. Number six, no one will know the day of Christ's return. No one will know the time of Christ's return. That is a warning against anyone, and there's been many, anyone who says, hey, I know when Jesus is coming. You've heard about that, haven't you? Such and such a person throughout history, this person, that person, has said they figured out when Jesus Christ is returning and other people fell for it and sold their homes and everything else, ran out to the hills or the caves. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 36, but about the day or the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son. He's talking about himself. Not even Jesus knows when he's returning. He says that clearly. But only God the Father. For whatever reason, God the Father is keeping that a secret from Jesus. So let me put it to you this way. If Jesus, if even Jesus doesn't know when he's returning, how in the world would any human being know? Make sense? If Jesus doesn't know, nobody will be able to know when he's returning. Even when the disciples were, even, let me back up, even when Jesus was about ready to go to heaven, the disciples asked him, hey, one more question, folks, Jesus, before you just, you know, float up to heaven. When are you returning? 
And he said this in Acts chapter 1. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates. The Father has set by his own authority. So nobody knows. So what does that leave us? Don't listen to anybody who says they know. Don't listen to them. Don't fall for it. Satan will send out people like that. Don't ever try to figure that out. Don't even let that be a question in your mind. When, Jesus? Just keep praying that as soon. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Number seven, last one, you're getting there. There will be signs in the skies, the seas will roar, and heavenly bodies will be shaken. In other words, this world will react. The whole universe will react to Jesus' return. The whole universe will. Tremendously, violently, overwhelmingly, the world will take notice and react to Jesus' return. I got a question for you. I, I need a victim, but I can't really do that here. I, okay, I'll involve all of you folks. All of you, I want to ask you to do something very hard, very challenging right now. Don't have to get up from your seat or anything like that. But on the count of three, I want you to blink your eye. You ready for this? One. Two, two and a half, three. Very good. Was that hard? No, you do it all the time, they science to say. In the blink of an eye, that's when Jesus Christ will return, Scripture says, in the blink of an eye. Just like that. But even then, the whole world will react. Mark 13 24 through 27 says, Jesus is saying, But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give us light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and He will send His angels and gather His elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Mark 13. Let's keep on going. Luke 21, he keeps talking about this. He says, And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on the earth, distresses of nations because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, and people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming over the world. For the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your Heads, because your redemption is drawing near. As bad as it's going to get, folks, look up. Rejoice. Because what's about to happen will be good for you. Will be your victory. Will be your salvation. You'll be seeing Jesus. And what's the downside to that? One more scripture. This isn't Jesus speaking. This is... 1 Corinthians 15, 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, Jesus will come. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will be changed. You want to be changed? We usually don't like change, but guess what? You're going to be changed big time. From your old self to your new self. Get a new body, no arthritis, all that stuff. In the twinkling of an eye. One of these days, very soon I believe, Jesus is going to split the sky in two on a bright, beautiful blue sky like today. He's going to split all the clouds, split that blue sky in two, and we will see Jesus plain and clear, no doubt. It'll be obvious with all of his power, with all of his authority, with all of his glory, and the whole world will see it, no doubt. One of these days. So no matter how bad and awful the headlines get, we still have hope. We still have joy. Because Jesus told us, told us that. Rejoice. Your salvation is coming. I'm going to read the rest of Thessalonians. It now tells us, instructs us how to live our days, knowing that Jesus is coming is just around the corner. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Just listen. Now, brothers, oh, about the dates we do not need to write to you. For you know that very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Did you hear that? God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. Pretty clear, pretty straightforward, amen? No guesswork there? Jesus is very plain, very clear, and so are the other scriptures. May it be so with us as we continue to live for him because he died for us. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us these clues, these signs that we should live by. Thank you, Jesus, that you're living in our hearts and that we don't walk alone. Thank you, Jesus, that you're coming back and we don't need to be afraid, but we can rejoice. So again, Jesus, Maranatha, come soon. And we'll give you all the praise we can. We thank you. We love you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And we all say. Psalm 17 says this. As for me, I shall behold thy face in righteousness. And when I awake, I shall be satisfied with beholding thy form. And live with thee forever. So again, may you live for him because he died for you. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Amen.